Good morning. Welcome to our church, First United Methodist in Humboldt, the corner of 12th and Crenshaw. If you are listening to this online on Wednesday, we're glad that you're here. We invite you to come and join us in person. We are observing social distancing. We are wearing masks, uh, obviously not when we're standing up here, but at other times we are wearing masks around each other and our pews are separated uh, to maintain that isolation, that distancing. Um, we want to get rid of the isolation though. So come and join us if you can and just follow the rules and I think everything will be fine. It's time for the church to come back together. Today's Sunday School lesson uh, comes from Revelations. Chapter 21 uh, begins talking about a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Um, and just kind of stop for a minute. The sea here is representing chaos, evil, all the bad things, the salt water, the impure. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Heaven is not the skies above us, but the abode of God, the dwelling place. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life, spring, fresh water, pure water. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Revelation 22, verse 12. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. The purpose today is to talk about something, a concept that's really hard for us to understand uh, the relevance it has to our daily lives, and that is that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the, both the beginning and the end. So while Revelation has a lot of ideas and information that we can take away, we're, we're kind of going to focus on, on pretty much on that, the beginning and the end. I want you to imagine, if you will, the very beginning. What does that look like in your mind? What do you see when you think of the beginning? Do you think of the creation? the seven days of creation, the order that God created things, because that's really not the beginning. When you think about the end, do you think about the end as described in Revelations, where we have the new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth, the evil are consigned to the fiery lake? That's really not the end either. So this is the hard thing to understand, is that God always has been, always will be, and has no end. It's like a circle. It's connected. There's no beginning, there's no end, it's just always God. And I can't explain that. 
But what I'm hoping to talk about is why this concept is important for us today. Um, looking at Job 38, verse 4. Now in Job, uh, he is tested by the adversary, by Satan. He is not helped by his friends. His life is, as he knows, it is destroyed. And he is a, a strong man. He is a man of God. And in the beginning of Job, God says to Satan, look at my servant Job. He's a great man. And then begins the testing, the trials. God allows things to happen. He allows the adversary to take away, to destroy Job's life. And towards the end, Job finally begins to complain and to say, I don't understand. Why is this happening? His friends have influenced him, and he is challenging. God answers out of a storm. Job 38. Now, God was silent before this. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Verse 4. Where were you? Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? You tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions, who stretched a measuring line, who set the footings, laid the cornerstone. Where were you? And of course, Job wasn't there, and there is no answer to that because nobody was there but God. Genesis begins with, in the beginning, God. That's it, God. So this is an esoteric, obscure idea that is impossible to really understand. So how does that affect our lives today? What, why do I care? What meaning does that have for me? So looking at Revelation, it was written by a man named John. Maybe it was the same John who wrote the gospel, and maybe it was a different John who was a church leader. I don't think that matters to me. In any case, this John was concerned about the seven churches in Asia, and he was writing to encourage them, to restore them to truly following Christ. He wrote from the island of Patmos, where he had been exiled. And he wrote about the many visions he received while they are visions from God. Now, at this particular period in time, Rome was busy conquering the world. Uh, like many other conquering nations, one of the means they used to control their subjects was to control their worship. They required emperor worship. If you did not come and worship the emperor at the appointed time, you could be put to death or imprisoned or fed to the lions. This is nothing new to the world. If you recall in Daniel, this is the same thing that happened. Daniel and his friends were called to bow down and worship the, the golden statue, to worship the emperor. They were forbidden to pray, and yet they did so anyway. When this began, the Jews were exempt from the emperor worship. It was understood that the Jewish people were not allowed to worship any other god than their god. And because they were a sizable minority, the Roman government decided it was probably in their best interest to allow them to continue. Uh, the Jews were prosperous people. They were bringing money in, taxes, etc., and they were less likely to cause trouble if they were allowed to worship their God. When Christianity came into being, when Christ followers started coming along, they were initially all Jewish, and so this exemption continued. But as time went by, as Christianity spread, more and more of its followers were not Jewish. And Christianity began to be recognized as its own religion, separate from the Jews in Rome, became aware of their refusal to worship the emperor, and persecution followed. And there, we've read about some of this. Um, Stephen was persecuted. He was killed. Uh, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was seeking out the people, the, not, the, the Christians that he considered heretics because they weren't really following the Jewish religion. Uh, we've got stories in um, the Bible, in movies, in books of Christians that were persecuted, fed to the lions, made to fight giants in the, in the, um, in the ring for the Roman emperor's entertainment. 
John was writing to encourage the Christians of this time to hold on to their faith, to not fall away, to not become lukewarm. And if you want to take the time and look through the beginning of Revelations where he talks to these individual churches and explains to them how they're falling short. It's, that's kind of helpful to us today because you think, yeah, I'm kind of falling away. I'm following over here and not really staying true to what the Bible says, who God is and what, how we are to live our lives. So John was writing to encourage them. Some groups were attempting to worship both the emperor and God, and that doesn't work. Others just abandoned Christianity altogether. And whatever the current flavor of religion was, that's what they followed. So Revelations can be considered a pastoral letter to the churches of that time and was written with imagery that the people of their time would understand but that we find hard to understand. But again, the main purpose was to encourage them to remain faithful despite the persecution. The last two chapters of Revelations are the end of the story, the end of the Bible, the denouement. It wraps up the loose ends, ties the different parts together, uh, if you will, think of the final scenes of a book or a movie where all the parts are finally come together and you understand where each piece fits in the overall story. And then you kind of go, oh, that's what it was about. If you look at the Bible, it is one book. It is full of many stories. Um, everything in there fits into the overarching theme of God's love for mankind and his desire for relationship with us. So from Genesis, the first part of Genesis to the end of Revelation, that's the overall theme. And within that, there are smaller stories set that support this theme, that explain it, that elaborate on it, that help us understand on a human level. Because God is not human and we cannot understand the mind of God. We try to bring him down to our level and put him in our little box, but God is not there. And so each of these stories are kind of object lessons for us to understand better. John writes of a new heaven and an earth coming down that follows, and this is the preceding chapter, the judgment of God. It is the end of death, the end of the grave. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, which is the abode of God. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 21 says, God is coming to live with man forever. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And if you'll think back to Exodus, this is God's whole point. Build me a sanctuary that I can come and be with you. God wants to be with us. This relationship is something he's desired since the beginning of creation, and it's actually the purpose of creation. When Adam and Eve were walking on this earth, God walked with them in the cool of the evening. He talked with them. He spent time with them. This was his heart's desire. This was his purpose. And that relationship was ruptured by sin that came in. And now finally, at the end of Revelations, we see that that rupture has been restored and we can resume that relationship with God. Verses 5 through 6 tell us that all things are being made new. This is the final resolution. No more death, no more mourning, no more tears. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek alphabet are the A and the Z. This is the final act of God's plan that began in Genesis. And all who are thirsty will have water without cost, pure water, spring water, my favorite line, I think, is in verse 7. Those, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is everything our hearts yearn for. This is the hole we have in our lives that we seek to fill through different things, maybe by reading books, getting lost in them, or watching movies, or maybe through drugs or alcohol, or leading an immoral lifestyle, or being afraid to be alone, and always having to be busy and seeking to be around people. This is the hole that's in our hearts that is filled only by God, and it will once and for all be filled and completed. Chapter 22 
changes voice. And it seems that this is Jesus speaking now of his return, his identity as the Alpha and the Omega, the continuation of the triune God. So I want to finish by trying to put this together in a way that maybe helps with day to day. How do you want your story to end? This life is full of struggles. How do you want it to end? How do you want to be known? If somebody were to tell your life story, what would you want them to say? When your life is difficult, when it is filled with adversity, does it help to know that God wins in the end? That when all the bad things are going on and chaos is swirling around you, God is coming, the end is coming, and all of that will be resolved. If you can trust that God is eternal and that he will do things in his time, does that relieve some of the anxiety you feel? Go back to Genesis, to Abraham and Sarah, with the child of the promise when they were in their old age. And they were still waiting after the promise had been made. And Sarah attempted to force the issue. She used her maid Hagar to obtain a son, an adopted son. And in so doing, she caused more trouble, more problems. But in God's time, in his perfect plan, Isaac was born, the child of the promise. If we can wait on God to act, then we will have that perfect ending, that fairy tale story that we all desire, because it is coming. We have the responsibility of living on God's creation, and we have the ability to create or to destroy. But that doesn't mean that we are God. If we can remember that God is the Alpha and the Omega, maybe that can reassure us. Maybe that can help us to be patient and wait. Maybe that can help us to stay humble. So I leave you with two questions. How will you live differently knowing the end of the story? And finally, what hope does that give you? Thank you.